Oh, wow. So, yes, the, the title is a uh, vestige of a conference we hold each year called The Big Think, where we bring together CEOs to try to imagine the future in a, in a group setting where they often are in their own particular area and not realizing the commonality across companies. And what I'm going to try to share with you today is what we're learning from all the great entrepreneurs that we invest in and what patterns we're seeing across them. So rather than a series of distinct data points, there's some pretty big trends that are emerging. And I think if I was to summarize, it's a very exciting time. I think entrepreneurship and technology is increasingly defining the economy. It is the source of most future economic growth and is not a trivial side topic. I think everyone here today probably agrees that what you're doing is the vanguard of the future. And as an investor in these kinds of companies and people like yourself, it's never been a more exciting time. I think one of the reasons it's so exciting is that entrepreneurs can really change the world more than metaphorically, more than a marketing ploy, more than even Steve Jobs imagined when he first coined the term, do you want to change the world? Um, it's the inspiration behind our logo, the delta of the world, and it's really exciting when people take on planetary scale projects like Planet Labs you see here, or SpaceX, or Tesla, companies that I've uh, had the great honor to learn from. So let me share with you, let me see if I can uh, make this go to next, there we go. What I'm going to try to share in the next half hour and make it brief and hopefully have time in Q&A in the afternoon that they have set up for us on why I think disruptive innovation, a term you hear often, but one that I've been talking about for decades now, really is the fountainhead of innovation and economic growth. Why that will continue to accelerate forever, which is an interesting and debatable point, not something that saturates with an S-curve the way economists would like to tell you and the way any given product or service does, but a generalized capability that compounds forever and related more to the fundamental essence of what makes an information economy. And then of course, what's the new great thing that we think is coming out of that? And what investment sectors and what areas of growth do we see in the near future? And the quick answer is it's wider and more broad and more exciting than ever. First, a caveat. Everything I want to share with you is not really something I've thought of. I may at best have stitched a few ideas together, but these are ideas that other people have had. And every great success I show you is led by people like this. These are some of the entrepreneurs that I've had the great honor to work with. Um, and what you see in a lot of cases is folks who've entered an industry in which they had no prior experience. Uh, take just Elon Musk alone as an example. Industry after industry. He's never studied aerospace. He's never worked in an aerospace company. He's never worked in an automotive company. He's never worked in commercial banking when he's co-founded PayPal, and so on. It's kind of remarkable that in every case he took on industries that were understood to be near impossible for new entrants, right? New brands, new companies don't form that often, let's say in the automotive sector. Not since Henry Ford has ever been IPO in the US in the automotive sector, or in the military industrial complex. Imagine as a thought experiment, you were an immigrant from here to Russia and thought, you know, I'll just build a better rocket and take on Energia and Soyuz and find my way through whatever the political system is in Russia to just have a better product and that, that should win, the better product should win. And to think that Elon Musk, an immigrant from South Africa into the United States, did exactly that is kind of breathtaking. And I'll try to share with you today the power of an idea and how it can change the world. But first, I have to start with what I think the most important thing ever plotted, the most important thing ever graphed. It's the 120-year version of Moore's Law, and I always show this slide, and I always ask, and I want to if I may, how many people have seen it before? This is either Ray Kurzweil's version of Moore's Law. Keep your hand up just so I can do a rough tally. I'm gonna guess, and others may call me on this, that it's less than 20% of the room. Okay, so I'll, I'll briefly explain it. Nobody buys transistors. You companies, corporate buyers, no one says, give me a million transistors, please. What you buy is computational power or storage, right? How many gigabytes of storage on my flash drive? How many computational cycles per second can I buy if it's a CPU or a GPU or something like that? And here on this axis, we're plotting computational power that a dollar will buy. So constant dollars adjusting for inflation, how much computation can you buy? And when you plot it that way, there's a remarkable curve going back 120 years, long before there was anything called Moore's Law, long before anyone thought to plot the data. Every blue point, by the way, is the best price performance computer of the day. So there's blue dots below the curve, but this is the frontier of humanity's capacity to compute. When you plot it this way, it's kind of interesting. It has nothing to do with the integrated circuit. Everything you ever heard about Intel, 
being relevant to Moore's Law. It's just because their co-founder, Gordon Moore, named it, or at least Carver Mead called it Moore's Law. And that's why we thought it was something very unique about smaller, better, cheaper that had to do with semiconductors. It's really important to realize it has nothing to do with the integrated circuit. It has nothing to do with Intel in particular. It transcends all those technology substrates to a variety of different computers and different companies, all of whom have come and gone, all of whom have faced their own S-curve of saturated expectations, many of whom have gone out of business, but they've handed the baton to the next generation and so on. To give you a flavor of what some of those um, data points are, I think there's one more build on here. There we go. Oops. Let's see if I can go back one. Yeah. Just an example of some of the computers that are on this curve. The machine in 1890 that took the US Census. The machine in World War II that cracked the Nazi Enigma code, if you watch the movie Imitation Game. That was based on a bunch of relays. The transistor-based machine, excuse me, that was based on relays. Then the vacuum tube machine in 1956 that predicted Eisenhower's win. It's pretty remarkable. A few other takeaways. Great Depression, World War I, World War II, recessions have had no impact on this, right? Innovators don't stop innovating during economic cycles. It's an exogenous variable to the economy. Some would argue that this is what generates all economic growth. I would also argue that Intel has not been carrying the, the baton for the last seven years. It's been NVIDIA. And the big boom in deep learning that many people hear about, the big boom in artificial intelligence and machine intelligence is that people realize that these GPUs are much more closely patterned on the way our brain works than the traditional computers of the past. And so these newest algorithms won beautifully on these chips, and that's why NVIDIA has been holding the baton for Moore's Law for the last seven years. We think there'll be another generation, nanoelectronics, molecular electronics, we're investing in that. So it's not as if this curve is likely to end. And if you're gonna make any business prediction, in technology business in particular, for the next five to 10 years, this is probably the only thing you can hang your hat on, is that this is likely to continue. Almost everything else becomes harder to predict. But it's also somewhat philosophical, almost cosmological. Well, why is this? If it had nothing to do with what we were taught when the semiconductor industry was riding high, and if no one knew where they were on this curve, what explains it? Why is it that technology continues to compound? Why is it that we accept accelerating change as if it was a given? That wasn't the case throughout much of human history, right? 2,000 years ago, everything was cyclic. It was whether it was good or whether it was bad. Farm yields were good or bad, and generally any bearded prophet would predict doom as the near-term future, right? Pestilence, plague, watch out for the floods, but not nirvana, abundance, some singularity, whatever your language, this idea that we're actually on a curve of accelerating progress is really new. Like in the last few decades have people really absorbed this and internalized it. And I might argue that there is a generic reason for this. There were a bunch of books that came out in 2012 uh, by Matt Ridley, by Kevin Kelly, and by a um, fellow from the Santa Fe Institute, I'm drawing a blank on his name, The Economist, it'll come to me. All of which made the same argument. Their argument was every good idea happens about the same time. That every good idea is a combination of prior ideas and they're just recombining, kind of like memes, the, in the old sense of the word memes before the internet took it over and made it a different thing. Ideas, we're all propagating ideas. When we get together in events like this, we cross-pollinate like never before. When we hold our big think conference at DFJ, we're cross-pollinating like never before. At universities, in cities, people are more inventive per capita when they live in a city than when they don't because you can cross-pollinate ideas. So if every idea is a combination of prior ideas, you can consider progress as the combinatorial explosion that occurs as that set grows. There's a law called Reed's Law, it's like two to the end phenomenon that says as the number of members of a set grows, the possible subgroupings, the combinations of ideas that could be made, grows exponentially. And that might be why idea space, information technology, these things all seem to compound and Moore's Law is just one example of it. Matt Ridley, the British guy, of course, has the most humorous way of summarizing it, something you can discuss in cocktail conversations. Just think of it as ideas having sex, you're merely the vector to let these ideas spread and that's what the world's all about. Now, what does that lead to? Well, it's percolating into new industries. As you think about Moore's Law going up and up and up and up, things that were formerly trial and error experimentation, think about crashing a car to know whether it's going to be safe for the crash test dummy, right? That is a trial and error experimentation. So are most human clinical trials in the medical field. So are blowing up 13 rockets in a row the way the last space program did before you get one to succeed. You blow, you blow stuff up to learn. Now, when Moore's Law allows you to, you move that to simulation, right? So Boeing, ever since the 777, has not needed wind tunnels for anything, right? At least nothing in, uh, in, in, the, aer in the aerospace business. Some of their uh, Martian craft need it still for supersonic flight testing, but not, you know, airplanes don't need wind tunnels. 
And this, this is emblematic of what's happening throughout many, many industries. You know, Tesla doesn't need crash test dummies, right? They don't need to actually crash the car or run the wind tunnel experiment to know that their coefficient of drag will be X, Y, or Z, right? Computational fluid dynamics simulation has gotten good enough that we don't even think to do those physical experiments anymore. The moment an industry makes that shift, the pace of progress accelerates dramatically. These are some of the industries that we've been investing in for the last 10 years that we thought were ripe for this transition. And I think there will be new ones coming, you know, in all areas of the economy, financial services, agriculture, you name it. These are places that haven't faced a new entrant in decades. And what I, what I mean by new entrant is someone who's doing business completely differently, the way SpaceX was for the military industrial complex or Tesla for the automotive industry. There really is a watershed moment before everyone's doing business as usual, the big get bigger, after, oh crap, big companies are like, what do we do, right? Like the automotive industry is freaking out collectively and rapidly trying to shore up software skills they've atrophied for decades. Um, they haven't really faced a real competitor until now because they don't compete with each other. They just do business as usual. Which, oh, by the way, is a caveat. I believe all meaningful change, all change for which a history book might one day be written about, comes from new entrants. It never comes from an existing company in their existing business. And I don't know of any rule of thumb in business that is more universally true than that. In other words, I can't think of even anything that's more true than that. There, is, there are zero exceptions that I can think of. People sometimes mention Hewlett Packard or Apple, but in those cases, their innovation was when they went outside their core business, right? Apple has not innovated in desktop or laptop computing for a decade. HP got into printers, they haven't done a thing since. Google will never reinvent search in a meaningful way, in a disruptive way. They'll do autonomous cars, reinvent the data center cooling systems, things that aren't their core business. They'll pivot into adjacent businesses, and if they're smart, do it in a way that's synergistic, but even big companies, if they're going to innovate, they do so outside the core. And when I say innovate, I mean meaningful innovation. Innovation we care about, innovation people will remember 20 years from now. So let me give an example. SpaceX. Uh, everyone has heard the news and sees these incredible images of rockets coming back to Earth the way they should, like from comic book era. Uh, plans to colonize Mars, plans to make humanity a multi-planetary species, which according to some on a short list of evolution's greatest hits would be like one of those check boxes, like, you know, the opposable thumb, you know, standing upright, colonizing other planets. I mean, like, that's a big deal. It's not just changing the world, it's changing other worlds, right? Like Mars is a fixer upper planet and Elon thinks, let's change it. Like, where does a new entrant get that kind of scope of ambition, that breathtaking hope? And we actually believe he's going to do it, right? That's even more interesting. Seems more credible than any other space program we've heard about. Kind of interesting. What I want to highlight about SpaceX, and it's emblematic of all the companies that I get personally excited about, is there's a mission. There is a passion that is leading him that is not profit. Profit is a byproduct of the mission, and every employee knows it, every customer knows it, every partner knows it, and it's an incredibly powerful dynamic. You could argue that Google and Facebook have an element of that in their mission, all was staying to their mission. Tesla certainly, Planet Lab certainly, the companies we love tend to have that. And the ones that frankly don't last the vicissitudes of a quarterly economic burp or a setback in a business unit are those who don't really know what their mission is, if it's money. Because everyone can argue about how to make the most money next year, next quarter, next month. But colonizing Mars, there's no arguing about that. Like, we're going to Mars. Like, does this help us get there or not? That makes a real focusing of the mind. Every employee that walks in the SpaceX doors sees those two images, they're huge, of Mars and Mars terraformed. And they're reminded every day as they walk into work that yes, they have a breathtaking ambition, one that 10 years ago people would chuckle and dismiss. Everyone in the aerospace industry is like, oh Elon, that's so cute, you wanna to go to Mars. <laughs> Good, you go there, you spend all your money going to Mars, meanwhile, we're gonna ignore you. And then when they see the pace of progress, it's, it's scaring the crap out of them. In fact, they pretty much have had the competitive response of we give up. Uh, for those not in the aerospace industry, you don't see this this often, where a new entrant, SpaceX in rockets, planet in satellites, literally enters with an argument that they have a thousand X cost advantage. And you talk about a 10 X, you may or may not believe it, 100 X, you almost never hear it. Entering with a thousand, and actually one of those two companies I, I, look, I averaged down, it's actually a 10,000 X advantage. And when the incumbents say, not, oh, we're going to build a better product, we're going to leapfrog you, we'll get you back, which you usually would do. Let's say if you're Bill Gates or Larry Ellison, you wouldn't just give up. They just give up. They literally go to their governments and say, we need more billions of handouts, otherwise we can't compete, both in Europe with Ariane Spas and SpaceX in the U and sorry, SpaceX's competitors in the US. 
The Chinese minister say we can't compete even if we had all Western technology. We think SpaceX is lying on their prices on their website because they're the only company that lists prices on their website. You know, everyday low shopping, you just go buy a rocket launch, you know, click to buy. Anyway, speaking of rockets, I love them. I'm a geek, and my son and I have been launching rockets out in the Black Rock Desert uh, for 13 years now. This is one we did recently. They go supersonic with computers. It's just a really fun hobby, gone completely crazy. And a few um, years ago, actually it was 2010 or 11, I believe, there were these folks from Google and NASA that were flying a phone. And they kept saying this, at the time, new HTC Android phone is more powerful than any satellite in orbit when it comes to processor, memory, and the imager pixels. Not imager size, but just number of pixels. Which is kind of mind-boggling to think that an off-the-shelf cell phone just six years ago even as recently as four years ago, had more power than anything in orbit. You know, these things in orbit cost a billion dollars of almost unlimited government spending and the latest and greatest technology that they could procure, but they had other incumbencies. They needed to fly things that were proven space-worthy or radiation-hardened. They didn't use off-the-shelf commercial parts. And in the past, that might have been so painful. Today, when you have a doubling of compute power every year, if you're using 10-year-old technology, that means you're a 1,000x worse just because of Moore's Law. Right? That's why the Mars rover, the latest one on the moon, only has a two megapixel camera. Because, uh, you know, it was a design freeze in 2004. Two megapixel cameras were state of the art in 2004. So we tested these camera, uh, these, uh, these uh, phone uh, satellite prototypes. They're just phones in a box, uh, in, a, in a pumpkin 1U CubeSat. And they've since flown three of them in orbit. But the team involved went on to leave NASA. I, I kept in touch with them over the years. And they formed this company called Planet. And here we are in, at the DFG offices with the, two of the three founders. And what I'm holding is their first product. Uh, it's not a model. It's not a scale model. That's, that's how small they are. These tiny satellites, of which they've flown more than every other satellite company combined. They've flown hundreds of these in space. And they're going to launch 100 more in Q1 of 2017. And they're basically going to raster scan the planet. They're going to go over the north-south pole in a string as the Earth rotates, they're going to image every meter of the Earth every day, which is pretty amazing. I'll show you in a moment what you can do with that. So you build flocks of these things. They're called doves, uh, you know, peaceful little birds. And they just toss these things out of the space station, which that's what it looks like. It's amazing to see your own satellite fly. You don't, you don't really get to get that kind of image. And what do you get? You get pictures all over the planet all the time. So here's one. Interestingly, uh, something that Google and a bunch of companies are paying a lot of money for is the ability to just look down at refineries because all these storage tanks, for various vapor pressure reasons, have a floating top, meaning they cast a shadow in oblique sun angle so you can tell how much oil is in every tank from above as long as you're looking straight down. So when you're raster scanning the planet looking straight down, you get this imagery for every oil refinery every day. And if you use synthetic aperture radar, you can look through clouds and get the same data. So there's a lot of things you could measure every day. Count every car in every parking lot every day to measure industrial output or compare Walmart to other retailers. Uh, count, the planet's going to offer for free a tree count. How many trees are on the planet by geography every day geocoded? Every tree on the planet. The height of every water reservoir. Any conflict zone for journalists, you have visibility into it. And it's already being started to be used by journalists. This is going to be a big data play. Oh, extraordinary, from you know, all the data from above the cloud. And they're going to have to run machine learning algorithms to find things like all new housing starts, all new construction activity, because you can run search algorithms across this data set now like never before. You can also see changes. So here's something from September, just before Hurricane Matthew, and just after. I'll try to go back and forth just a couple times. You can see all those areas are blue. And then if we use the near infrared, you can really see it very, very clearly just change, right? So why did I go through this example? Because I think it's emblematic of many. What's happened in this area of satellite business is that you have cheaper access to space with SpaceX. It's kind of like fiber optics made the internet possible, and you have cheap access to the internet. People innovate on the data and services side. Similarly to space. If you can get to space more easily, satellite companies can innovate. When they innovate, they can provide data sets back to entrepreneurs like yourself that might want to use that data for who knows what applications. Simulation, right? The Planet Lab satellite worked the very first time they flew it. First satellite worked perfectly. The first Falcon 9 flew perfectly. It's kind of amazing when you can run simulations and remove millions of iterations, I'm not, sorry, hundreds of iteration cycles out of what otherwise would have been a physical process. Commodity off-the-shelf hardware, almost everything we invest in, in robotics, um, advanced uh, actuators, satellites, drones, they're basically using the componentry you'll find in your cell phone, something that Chris Anderson called the peace dividend of the cell phone wars. That when Apple and Samsung were beating each other to death on commodity pricing, well, those processors, low-power memory, six-axis accelerometers that let you know exactly how you're moving, these are the components of almost every product you could care about. Every robot, that's basically all you need to make it a smart robot, the way we think and others are doing. 
dematerialization of value as a theme. Think about the phone in your pocket, I think is emblematic, a very physical good. It, it eventually reduces to the minimalist vessel for, for code. It is a gateway to software and services. You don't expect the physical interface to change, right? Google comes out with a new Pixel phone, looks surprisingly similar to every other phone, but we know there's something cool and exciting in the software services layer that they speak for, that they, of course, bundle in their, in their you know, Google-esque way. Um, that's what we care about. That's what the car is becoming. That's what the robot is becoming. That's what the satellite is becoming. It's all about the software and services. The thing will cost a dollar a pound. Everything will cost a dollar a pound in the future. And that gives you access to all kinds of cool stuff, but I'll skip that. Give you a new example that's coming that might be really relevant to every entrepreneur in the room who has anything to do with internet, be it cloud services, reaching consumers, or whatever. If, you just, if the internet is in your business in any way, there's something happening in the next five years that you should definitely have on your roadmap. And that is, we're gonna see the greatest change in people's access to the internet than we've ever seen the greatest delta shift in people's connection to the global economy than ever before. Specifically, I'm referring to broadband satellite connections. So this was attempted a few years back and failed with Teledesic and others, but there are at least two companies and actually a handful of others in Europe, but two publicly announced, SpaceX and OneWeb, who intend to blanket the world with thousands of satellites that are flying much closer to Earth. So it's not like the old satellite phones where you had this latency getting out to a geosynchronous satellite and back again, and the speed of light was just too long. This will actually be lower latency than your fiber optic network. So faster connectivity, faster uh, acknowledge and receive signals. And it's about a gigabit down and up for $200 base station. So a thing on the ground with a phase array antenna, you could throw it on a roof in Africa, no wires, nothing connected, just a, just a standalone box that has a solar cell phase array antenna, LTE chipset, ethernet chipset, the whole thing. Lights up a village, lights up a town that has no internet access, all the devices are lit up through LTE. This will bring us from about two to six billion people online much quicker than most forecasters had thought. First satellites are flying this year. The network, if all goes well, should be up in 2019 in its fledgling form, 2020 by its full form. That's not too far from now. So roughly five years from now, it starts. By 10 years, this should be fully played out. It will go from two to six billion, maybe two to eight billion, arguably, online. All those people have access to online education. They will be great coders, programmers, abilities to contribute ideas like never before. They will be vessels for ideas, the memes of modernity, the fountain of innovation that could follow is unprecedented, I think, in economic history. I don't know what's gonna come of this, but any product or service that you're building, if it could be something that the poorest of the poor could use with the weakest of the phones, ideally with a voice interface if they're illiterate, you might have a good business now, but I think you'll be heading into an area of hypergrowth. That's what I'm actually trying to find more examples of, people providing, let's say, free healthcare forever via a cell phone for some population today in anticipation of what's about to come. By the way, this is what that ground station looks like. Um, one of them, this is OneWeb's early prototype. The, the antenna actually will be flat, so the entire thing will be a flat surface thing. Uh, Rodney Brooks and Rethink Robotics is another example of this I, I've alluded to already, so I won't maybe say much on this slide other than industrial robots are being used in less than 10% of the places they should be used. China is buying them in like multitudes. These are robots that you could just plop in a chair wherever you have a sedentary human and they can do anything a human can do. They have the same reach, speed, accuracy, control. They work day and night. They don't unionize. All that. They don't jump off roofs. I mean, they just do the monotonous robotic work. It is robotic work after all um, that humans should not be doing. Right? Nobody wishes their kids would be doing it for a living. And uh, this is the older, the first version of their product. The new one's a lot more sleek and, and it's called Sawyer. But the point that I really want to take away from this is that there's going to be massive shifts in the economy as in the future that, of course, you think about far enough in the future, things are obvious. There will be no manufacturing job. There will be no physical thing for which a human is better than a robot, right? And the area where robots are gonna have the biggest impact in the near term, of course, is driving. It's, by some estimates we put together for a book on the future of work, globally, if you just look at people who have a job, most people don't have a job, 20% uh, of them drive for a living, globally. Right? In the US, in the majority of states, the number one employment is truck driving. Number one job in most states of America. All those jobs will eventually go away. I think the rickshaw driver will probably hold their job the longest because of the human interaction, but trains, long distance trucking, Uber-like services are all going autonomous. Um, I've driven as passengers and behind the wheel many, many times in these for about six, seven years now. And I honestly believe just like I did when I first experienced electric vehicles, that this is the inevitable trajectory. It's just a question of how, when, which, which sectors will happen sooner because of regulatory holdups and what have you. Um, but I mean, all vehicles, all planes should be robotic, all spacecraft, 
already are. Any new spacecraft design is. Every, every Airbus could be flown fully autonomously um, today, but for regulation. And it's going to lead to a pretty interesting future. There's a company we're involved with called Zooks. Strangely, which raised the largest Series A ever in history at the largest valuation ever in history, but they're completely stealth mode. Um, but they're not very good at their stealth mode. Most people know they're doing level four autonomous vehicles, meaning straight into an Uber-like replacement, um, or what Google's doing in a way. And they plan to get this out to market a lot sooner than most forecasters think. And, and the idea here would be quite, quite elegant. You would you just go around. Of course, you have you know, no steering wheel. You face each other in a nice cabin. Um, it, the car is bi-directional. It, in other words, it's symmetric in both directions. You never have to do U-turns. And it, there's so many interesting things. I won't go into it now. That if you rethink the vehicle from the ground up, never to have a driver. Uh, and you think about it only as a fleet vehicle that, that, that just blow your mind, that you thought, oh, you've seen everything in automotive. It's like, no. It's like, this is an industry that hasn't faced major innovation cycles for decades, and there's a lot of pent-up potential. This is a photo I took. It looks like a cartoon, but it's actually a photo I took inside of Google's vehicle, just to give a sense of, I don't know. No, their design aesthetic, I still think, needs a little work. It's just not grabbing me. I think the Marameco people could do a little number on this or something, because it, uh, it begs a lot. It does have a big you know, red stop button. Oh, I didn't show it in detail. Um, let me go back. But it does uh, have the similar idea that you know, they're not going to be a steering wheel. It's going to usher you around. And again, they'll have a pretty big economic impact and employment impact on dislocation of the economy. Now, what I want to end on, just a few slides, and I'll try to... Uh, because I think it's the most important thing currently happening in technology. So most of what I've showed you is a somewhat timeless, in a way, framework that we use for thinking about what to invest in next. We think about Moore's Law, we think about what's the next thing that's just at the edge of automation, at the edge of gamification, at the edge of simulation, that will lend itself to a radical shift. And, and we keep looking, right? And so I showed you some industries, and I think maybe, actually, let me go back so I'm not leaving that visual there that's gonna confuse because I'm not talking about it yet. Um, there are a lot of crappy industrial businesses that have had low gross margin, no one would want to be in it, no entrepreneur worth their salt, um, in this room at least, that thinks of themselves, let's say, as a dramatic change innovator, and I'm gonna, you know, would think to go into these sectors, right? Automotive, the military industrial complex. It's like a dead zone for resumes, right? But now it's very exciting, and that is rippling out. So my point from the prior slides was mainly that every industrial sector and information sector and financial services sector that may not have felt like a tech sector is becoming a tech sector. That's, that's what we look for. Okay, now how might they transition? I think deep learning, more broad, whatever I say deep learning, maybe just substitute machine intelligence so that we don't get too bogged down by any one particular branch. So this would include machine learning, this would include deep learning slash neural networks. It could include generative design, it could include other forms of evolutionary algorithms. They're all similar in their basic modality, which is they're modeled either in the brain or some biological process like evolution. They are ways of building learning machines. The general thing going on here is that you are building a generic brain that could learn anything. Much like an infant, a newborn human, could learn any language of the world. It's capable of learning any language of the world, but we train it to learn a particular handful of languages, or if you're in the US, just one language, uh, unfortunately. Um, but that capacity to learn was there. The same for these things. They can learn anything. And by the way, being a good brain designer doesn't mean you're a good teacher. So the innovation that's going on within Google, every product at Google is based on this, everything. Search Swift lower to it, everything at Google is based on deep learning. The people doing this are like magi. They're like these people that know how to do engineering in a different way, even though it's not that hard to learn at all. They are building artifacts no one else can understand, and they're doing so in very powerful ways. They're building things that exceed human understanding. They're building software that outperforms humans in basic tasks routinely. That's why I think it's really important, because it could be applied everywhere. So these brains are, uh, and these neural networks are an iterative process. Millions, billions, trillions of operations, just like evolution itself, gets you to an interesting place. Just like neuronal development, just like growing a teenager from a baby. There are these layers of neurons, and all the learning that goes on is about the process of creation, not the product. I'll come back to that later. But the, the most important takeaways are think parenting, not programming, process learning, not product learning. And they're domain independent. The good brain builders could go anywhere. This makes for incredibly weird labor markets. People are being acquired for between five and $10 million per person. You know, you look at any of the recent acquisitions in this sector, from Cruise to Auto to you name it, anything LinkedIn's bought recently. Um, it's kind of crazy, never seen anything like it. Uh, people coming straight out of master's programs getting $500,000 starting salaries, professors being poached with million dollar bonuses who have never had a job before. It's crazy because they can do anything. 
one of our genomics companies poached Google's head of uh, 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 document translation. He spent 10 years translating the world's languages. He got pulled into a cancer genomics company. He knows nothing about it. The people in this field pride themselves on not knowing the thing they're replying, just building better brains. And so they're very fungible. I'll skip this. I started studying this in the 80s. It was called neural networks. It's changed a lot. I'll try to tell you what's changed. Um, basically, you have a lot of data, right? Big data, you hear the term. It's kind of a misnomer. I think big data would, would be big headache. But for machine learning, if it weren't for these techniques, big data would just be a nuisance. Yeah, you do have algorithmic advances. Uh, Hinton and his team out of, in 2012, when they beat the ImageNet competition and others, have made some important imp improvements in supervised and unsupervised learning. But really, it's the data and, frankly, Moore's law, synapse scale, I call it. How many neurons can you simulate? And the big breakthrough around 2012 was when people realized, and they had for a while, where they finally published results, that if you switch from Intel chips to NVIDIA GPUs, you get incredible performance advantage because those widely, massively parallel architectures that, ironically, we built to render graphics for video games and first-person shooters, poetically, they're very much like our sensory cortex. And you can run these algorithms on them beautifully. You have a lot of compute nodes with a lot of interconnect and local memory, like what you need. To give a sense of time, in the 80s, we call them neural nets. You had maybe one to a million synapses. Google Brain, that found cats on the internet just looking at YouTube videos. More recently, just a couple of years ago, about a billion synapses. But we still have a ways to go. People sitting here in the room have about 100 trillion synapses. And when you were born, you had a quadrillion. You have about a 90% pruning from when you were an infant. So learning as you go. We've been investing in a bunch of companies using deep learning in different verticals. These are just a tiny subset of the verticals. There's a lovely market map that Bloomberg Beta put out that can give you a much larger, you know, beyond DFJ list. This is just things we've invested in. And the list goes on. In every case, these companies will say the way in which they compete in their sector is the use of deep learning. Like, in other words, like it's bullet point number one of why they exist as a company. The substrate is advancing. I, I won't belabor this much um, other than say that what had been Intel chips, then with the GPUs and FPGAs, which are these... In each case, as you go down this curve, it's more of a fine-grained architecture. You have more and more small amounts of compute with local memory as you go, kind of like closer to the brain. In fact, if I, if I put the brain on there, it'd be off to the right. And What's fascinating is the same thing that the Bitcoin miners went through. So today, all Bitcoin mining of, of note happens on ASICs. It actually involves more compute than the entire universe of CPUs. Every CPU on the planet doesn't hold a candle to the dedicated ASICs that are doing Bitcoin mining. Those ASICs are consuming the equivalent power of Ireland every day. On the deep learning side, there's some examples here. Nirvana, which just got acquired by Intel, this company I was on the board of. Our newest investment just closed last week, Isocline, which is doing the analog version of deep learning, even closer to the brain, where you don't even de deal in the, in the digital domain. And D-Wave, which is a quantum computer company, even more freaky, if you will, in that domain. So let me um, end with just one slide. Deep learning and neural networks, as I alluded to, are actually emblematic of a much larger set of similar algorithms. You see it in biological evolution. If you read Wolfram's A New Kind of Science and his visual study of cellular automata, as you see in the top right there, same kind of idea. Uh, genetic programming, which led to that antenna, you see that little paperclip-like thing that was flown on a NASA mission, derived with genetic programming. In all these cases, no one understands why they behave the way they do. No one can predict the next outcome of the algorithm. No one can tell you what 10 rows later in the iterative, let's say, cellular automata is going to look like unless you iteratively run the algorithm. There's no computational shortcut. There's no way to run evolution in reverse. There's no reverse evolution. There's something incredibly powerful in the mathematics of all these things that make them computationally equivalent to reality, and they are not, there's no way to accelerate the process other than just run the iteration more quickly on a broader computer, one that looks more like the brain, which I think is fascinating. Uh, in generative design, there's that, that trust there uh, that you can see on the right from Autodesk. There's many examples of, on their website about that. So very last quote. There's a computer science book by Danny Hillis, who I, I love him. Um, in the last paragraph, um, or last page of the book, he talks about the future of engineering and software engineering. And this was many years ago they wrote this, and I think it's prophetic, in that what we really are at the cusp of today is entering a new era of engineering, where we build more than we can understand, where we transcend human limitations in a sense to birth technologies that birth the technologies, to build learning machines that learn better than we can learn. For example, in training AlphaGo, they didn't train it with a human playing Go. They very quickly could do better by having one learning algorithm train the other in adversarial contests. And this is true throughout the ecosystem, that it's not just that we humans are no longer the vanguard of evolution. We are parenting the next generation. And we should get used to that and think about frameworks for ushering these new technologies in in a way 
that will take advantage of what they can offer, yet not give us the illusion of control. More specifically, I would argue that deep learning, as applied to engineering in general, all forms of engineering, is the biggest advance since the scientific method itself. The scientific method was a profound change in how we accumulate learning over time, how we move from random guesses that you know, crystals might work, or maybe it's astrology, or whatever someone might spout off, to how might we accumulate ideas that actually hold merit and predict the future and have descriptive power and throw away the ones that are bad. And I think deep learning is as powerful as that. So let me end with that and say, I think, in summary, we are entering an interdisciplinary renaissance, because every industry is opening itself up to these techniques. They aren't distinct from IT that we're now touching trillion dollar markets in the construction industry, one of our newest investments, in agriculture with synthetic meat. These are really exciting big markets. You're gonna see more black swans. There's a photo I took of a black swan metaphorically drinking from the fire hose, sort of my image of the future. There are gonna be more economic collapses, more financial disruption. That's gonna keep, keep going. But new entrants, small economies, small teams are increasingly gonna define the future. Big bureaucracies won't. So, this, you know, any team of any size, of any purpose, greater than seven people is going to be ineffective. Five to seven is the magic number. And they increasingly will define the world. These small teams are going to disrupt industry after industry. And therefore, it's a very exciting time for all of you in the room and anyone who's thinking adaptively. Thank you.